Okay, so welcome to today's tutorial in Bio Triple One. Sales and biomarkers. Okay, so my name is Madim Bachination. I'll be taking you through this tutorial on lipids, which is your tutorial sheet number four. Okay, so we'll go straight to the questions. I'm sure if you are stuck anywhere, you can leave a comment on the comment section and we'll be able to just uh, get back to you. All right, so question number one of tutorial sheet number four on lipids. The first question reads, state the functional group of lipids. So by definition, lipids are just basically hydrocarbons or biomolecules that contain uh, the elements or rather the atoms carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. In some cases, it may have other, uh, other elements such as uh, phosphorus in the case of uh, phospholipids. So when we look at the functional group of lipids, the functional group is just an ester. To be much more specific, it's a carboxylate ester. So these Carboxylate esters can be as simple as a pool, especially in the case of uh, uh, the fatty acids, because we know lipids, are, uh, there are numerous groups and different types of lipids. These may be either fatty acids or they can be phospholipids, they can be steroids or they can be waxes. So basically that is the functional groups. We all know from what we covered under carbohydrates to say functional groups are basically just uh, groups or rather moieties or just part of the, an entire molecule that is responsible for the chemical reactions. So for these functional groups, we know for certain to say, for, for these lipids, these, these, the functional groups are the ones that are responsible for the, for the major, for the chemical reactions that these lipids actually undergo. All right. So that is our functional group. 
Question number two. So question number two reads, state the difference between a saturated and unsaturated fats and give examples of each. So we know that saturated fats, these are fats that lack double bonds between the carbon to carbon, uh, between the, 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 the carbons, whereas uh, unsaturated fats have at least one double carbon to carbon bonds. I'll show you in a minute uh, what these are. So most uh, saturated, or let me say saturated fats are usually solids at uh, room temperature, whereas unsaturated uh, unsaturated fats are usually liquid at room temperature. So a good example of uh, a saturated fat is uh, butyric acid. We also have lauric acid. We also have stearic acid. And by structure, you know that your butyric acid has got this particular structure. All right. So your butyric acid, which is your, your, your saturated, you can see that there are no double, bond, no double bonds within the hydrocarbon chain. This double bond is, uh, is because this one is in the functional group. So this is your, if we were to, to draw this, or rather to simplify it, it, your butyric acid would look like this. That is your butyric acid. So you can clearly see that this is a, this is a saturated fat because there is no double bond within the hydrocarbon chains. Okay. All right. Whereas unsaturated unsaturated fats have double bonds have at least one double bond within the hydrocarbon chain. A good example of uh, a good example of a saturated fat is palmitoleic acid. We also have meristoleic acid as well as linoleic acid. So when we look at the structure of linoleic acid, uh, when we look at the structure of linoleic acid, it has got a double bond. So this is the structure of linoleic acid. So that's your structure of linoleic acid. So that's your structure of linoleic acid. So you can clearly see, you can clearly see that it has got two double bonds. When counting your carbon atoms, this is your carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, carbon six, carbon seven, carbon eight, carbon nine, carbon 10, carbon 11. So you can see that on carbon number 7 and on carbon number 10, there are double bonds. The fact that this, the, the fact that this fatty acid has got double bonds, it means it can undergo, it can undergo, it can, uh, it is actually, it's what gives it the property of it being unsaturated. All right. Okay, so question four. I'll read question four. Question three, actually. Question three says, define the terms, define the terms hydrophilic, hydrophobic, and amphipathic. Okay. So I'm sure we covered uh, this in, in, in the other tutorial on water. But because we are, we, are, we are also dealing with lipids, I feel we need to get back to it and just really define what it is. 
All right. So when we look at uh, when we look at hydrophilic, by definition, a hydrophilic molecule is a molecular entity that is attracted to water molecules, and it actually tends to be dissolved by water. So you can clearly see that since water is, is polar, when we covered water, we discussed that water is polar, meaning it has got two charges. It has got, the, it has got an electronegative uh, oxygen atom and has uh, a positively charged, two positively charged hydrogen atoms. Because of this polarity, it's able to attract other, 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 other polar molecules. Now when we talk about uh, hydro, hydrophilicity, this is just the property of a particular substance to be dissolved by water because of its uh, polar nature. Because of its polar nature due to the charges that arise within the molecule. So when we, we, can, we can however differentiate uh, hydrophobicity as simply a physical property of a molecule that causes it to, be, to seemingly be repelled by a mass of water. So in a situation where we can have, um, in a situation where we have maybe just water in a, in, in a, maybe in a cup or in a, in a drum, there are certain molecules which when you put in your, in your water, these, the first thing is they, they will not be attracted to, they will not be attracted to water, they are repelled by the mass of water. In the case of some, uh, in, in, in the case of fats, because we know that fats are simply hydrocarbons and these are actually insoluble in water. So what will happen is if you have a known mass of water, your, your, fats will just be, your fats will just be floating on water because they can't be dissolved and they, they are more like water hating. So when you look at hydro, uh, hydrophilicity or rather hydrophilic uh, molecules, these were taken from uh, from the two words, which means hydro means water. Hydro means water. Phobic means fear from the Latin. All right. So everything that is actually hydrophobic is water fearing or water hating. Whereas everything that is hydrophilic is water loving. All right. Then we also have uh, most when we when, when we talk about hydrophobic hydrophobic uh, hydrophobic molecules, these molecules are usually nonpolar. All right, because we discussed the property of water, where um, the property of water where this has a positive charge and this has a negative charge. So everything that is nonpolar fails to be attracted to water. All right. Do I have a marker? Do I have I had something to erase the ball? Okay. You can get me something from Dr. Mike. Oh, that can be. Okay. So the other term that we are defining in, in question number three is amphipathic. Now, when we talk about amphipathic, an amphipathic molecule is a molecule that has both a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic region. Some of the key terms that you need to understand uh, that are related to this is zwitterion, and that's quite zwitterion. So when you define a zwitterion, a zwitterion is simply uh, a molecule that has got two different uh, charges, where there's a positive charge and a negative charge. So, but when you when you look at uh, amphipathic molecules, these are molecules that actually have a region which is hydrophilic and a region which is hydrophobic within the same molecule. A good example is uh, a phospholipid, which we'll cover in the in, in the in in a question in in the question that is uh, coming. All right, question. Number four. So question number four says, identify two groups that would be attracted to water and which would not be attracted to water in a phospholipid. Okay, so the best thing we would do is I'll give you the structure of a phospholipid so that you can actually understand it better. So when you look at a phospholipid, a phospholipid is, uh, is, is 
is a, a fat molecule. A phospholipid is a fat molecule that is made up of a polar head and a non-polar tail. Now, remember, we said uh, triglycerides. Triglycerides are basically made up of two, uh, are made up of three fat molecules and one glycerol molecule. Okay, but phospholipids are made up of, as the name suggests, this is made up of a phosphate group which makes a polar head and uh, two hydrophobic tails, meaning these tails are water heating. Now, the structure of uh, the structure of a phospholipid is as shown in this diagram. So, you have your R group, all right, bonded to your oxygen, to your phosphate. Okay. Then you have. Let me simplify it so that you can actually so that you can see the structure easily. Okay. Okay, so this is how a phospholipid looks like. By structure, this is how a phospholipid looks like. So you can clearly see that this has this, this is your polar head. This is your polar head. And these are your non-polar tails. Okay. So phospholipids are basically just made up of a polar head. So this head is hydrophilic. Hydrophilic. Whereas this tail is hydrophobic. In other words, water hating. Because you know that these fatty acids, by when you bring up the structure of a fatty acid, it's just basically looks like this. All right, it can either be saturated or unsaturated. So by nature, this the functional group for 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 for, for the fatty acids in itself does not induce water loving properties. So. Clearly, we can see that this, the, the, the tails are actually hydrophobic, so they, they are water heating, whereas the head is hydrophilic. This is because it actually has a net negative charge that is usually induced by the phosphate group. All right, so the first, the phosphate groups gives it a charge which makes it be attracted to water molecules. All right, so it gets attracted to to water molecules because of the charge. This, you know that phospholipids are very important in the formation of biological membranes. And you know that this, this course is just basically cells and biomolecules. 
So we understand that for all organisms, these actually have cells. Now, all these cells, I know most of the most of most of the people when they are, to, they are told, they are usually told, okay, lipids are bad, fats are bad for your health, fats are, are, are not good. You didn't, you don't need to consume fats. But the truth of the matter is that these actually, these fats, these 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 uh, these lipids, they are different classes. They are in different classes. They are in different classes. So we have the famous triglycerides. These are the different types. Huh? We have the famous triglycerides. We have got the steroids. We have got waxes. All right. We also have tapins. So all these, all these play different roles. One of the major functions of, uh, of, of lipids is to act as an energy storage. Remember when we did carbohydrates, when we did carbohydrates, we discussed that glucose is the preferred form of energy for the cells. So now what actually happens, what actually happens is that when, when the body has got enough, when the body has got enough glucose, what it, when, it, when the body does not have enough glucose, it usually breaks down these different fats into monomer units that can actually be hydrolyzed. So now, all these, the triglycerides, the steroids, the, 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 the waxes, the tapins, we have got different types. All these different types play different roles. They play different roles in the body. Now, the phospholipid is one of the most important, is one of the most uh, important uh, lipid in the body because it makes up cells. And you know that all organisms need cells for them to survive. We said cells are the basic functional units of all organisms. So now what actually happens, these phospholipids make biological membranes. I remember we covered this on tutorial sheet number one, where we covered the fluid mosaic model. So all cells are essentially, they're just made up of these phospholipids, where we have, uh, I remember we, we did this when we covered uh, the lipid bilayer. All right, we covered the lipid bilayer and I gave you uh, a, a wonderful diagram and I sent you some videos that were explaining. Okay, so we covered this. All right, so we covered this. All right, so we covered this. So all cells are actually made up of phospholipid bilayer. So these phospholipids are important in uh, in determining uh, in, a, in in giving the 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 bilayer its properties. You know that the cell membranes they are responsible for allowing certain molecules in and out of the cell. Okay, you talk about molecules like glucose, like carbon dioxide, like oxygen. We covered all those. So this is basically what we mean when we talk about. Uh, when we talk about uh, the the phospholipids all right so this is how a phospholipid is you can see that when we when we covered the phospholipid we said one tail one of the phospholipid tails is usually in a linear uh, in a linear arrangement whereas the other tail has got a kink this kink is induced by this double bond which you see here all right Okay, so I think we can go to the next question. All right, question number six. I would love us to answer question number six before we answer question number five, because question number six is uh, a repetition of what we've actually done. Question number six says, draw the structure of a phospholipid and explain whether it is soluble in water or not. Okay, so this is a phospholipid. This is the structure of a phospholipid. I'll just erase everything else so that we can actually. Um... Okay, so this is hydrophilic. Okay. So that's a phospholipid. It has got a hydrophobic region and a hydrophilic region. Okay, so the question is, is a phospholipid soluble in water? The answer is no. 
phospholipids are not soluble in water. Okay, the reason is simple. It's due to the hydrophobic tails or the hydrophobic regions, which are usually repelled by a mass of water. So what actually happens when you look at when you look at even just the membranes, the polar head So, you remember when we covered uh, Okay. So this is your, your hydrophilic sac, which loves water. So what actually happens is the heads usually face the side where there's water. Okay. Whereas the tails face away from the water. This is what makes the cell, the membranes, uh, the biological membranes, this is what makes it difficult for the biological uh, membranes to transport water such that they need a particular channel protein called an apaporin for water to just actually go through the membranes. This is because these molecules, the phospholipids themselves, they are insoluble in water because they've got a, they've got a non-polar region and a polar region. So these are actually, these are actually uh, not soluble in water. And by nature, all fats, or rather all lipids, are actually insoluble in water. Okay, we can move on to question number five. Okay, so question number five. Question number five reads, illustrate and explain how a triglyceride is formed. Okay, so a triglyceride is a type of lipid that is made up of one glycerol molecule and three fatty acids. And you really need to know the differences between a monoglyceride, a diglyceride, and a triglyceride. So a tri Glyceride, as, 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 uh, as the question is asking us, it's just, it's basically showing, telling us to illustrate. Now, every time you ask a question to illustrate, it, 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 it is requiring you to actually show what is actually taking place. So, in an exam, uh, in an exam, the standard is you explain a little bit of how it's formed, then you give us an illustration to show how these triglycerides are formed. All right. So, what happens is a glycerol molecule, this is glycerol. When a glycerol molecule undergoes a condensation reaction, so we have this fatty acid, we have a second fatty acid. Remember, the sequence does not really matter. Because we may have one fatty acid which is saturated, 
Then we can also have maybe another fat acid, a fatty acid which is unsaturated. And the third one can be either saturated or, uns or unsaturated. Okay, and if you've noticed, I've put this is an example of a trans fatty acid. This one is a cis fatty acid. So, but all of them are basically just, and uh, these are basically just unsaturated fatty acids. So the chains, the, the type of fatty acid, they, we can have different types of fatty acids. We can have maybe a fatty acid with 18 carbon atoms. We can have a fatty acid with uh, maybe 20 carbon atoms. Remember, the sequence doesn't really matter. What matters is the, the, the type of fatty acid. The particular fatty acid can, can be the first fatty acid. For instance, maybe linoleic acid. Or maybe the second one can be stearic acid. Or it can be any other uh, fatty acid. So what actually happened? Remember, we defined condensation reactions when we were dealing with carbohydrates as simply uh, the, the coming together of two monomer units. In the case of carbohydrates, we talked about uh, monosaccharides coming together, undergoing a condensation reaction, which is basically two monomer units coming together and water is expelled out of the system. So in a likewise manner, we've got a glycerol molecule and three fatty acids. So what will happen, a condensation in other terms is just simply called a dehydration reaction. So what will actually happen is when these, when these fatty acids react, remember, we said it's the functional groups that are responsible for most of these, uh, most of the chemical reactions that these fats are going, that, that these fats undergo. So this, we know that this is the functional group this is the functional group for the fatty acids, whereas the reactive group, or rather the functional group in this glycerol is basically the hydroxyl groups. So what will happen is a water molecule will, the first water molecule will be expelled out of the system through the condensation reaction because it's dehydration. So it will be given out, all right? In the same manner, this water molecule will also be what? Be given out as well as this third water molecule. As these water molecules are expelled, an ester linkage is formed between these individual fatty acids and the glycerol molecule. So what we'll have, what we'll have as a triglyceride is what I'll show in a minute. So what will actually happen is these guys will, will form an ester linkage, right? All right. Okay. So now that is an example of a triglyceride. That's an example of a triglyceride. Okay. To differentiate it from phospholipids, we talked about phospholipid having two fatty acid chains and a phosphate group on the first carbon. All right, okay, so that's how you illustrate the formation of triglycerides. Okay, so question number seven. Question number seven says, list the different types of lipids and state their function. Okay. So, there are different types of lipids. We said we have got one, the phospholipids. We have phospholipids. Two, we have steroids. The third one, we've got waxes. Okay, so we also have triglycerides.
Okay, we can also talk about some sphingolipids. All right. Okay, so these are the types of lipids that we have. Okay. All right. So the question is just saying state. So if the question is just demanding you to actually uh, to actually state, this is stating the types of phospholipids. We have the types of uh, lipids that we have. So phospholipids, I'm sure uh, I've explained a lot on phospholipids. So phospholipids, these are just basically uh, lipids that are, these are important in, 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 in formation of biological membranes, and we know the importance of cells. So you know that every organism, every organism requires cells for them to perform their function for them to, to undergo, to do their different metabolic uh, reactions to, to maintain homostasis. So without phospholipids, there would be no cells really. And most of these uh, phospholipids are prevalent in most bacteria and, bacteria and other prokaryotes, but also found in other uh, animals such as human beings and uh, all these other animals, uh, the different types of animals. So those are, these are, that's that about this. So we also have the steroids. So when you look at steroids, these are, these are very important in metabolism. Okay, some common steroids that most of you know, we have uh, testosterone, testosterone hormone, which is found in men, in the testes. Then we also have the estrogen, all right. So we also have estrogen. Uh, we also have estrogen. So now, these are very important in immune function. When you look at steroids, these are very important in, in immune function. They play major roles in inflammation, in development, uh, also in development of uh, secondary sexual characteristics in, in, in men and, and in women. So these are actually very important. They are also important in, uh, in as I said, in, 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 in immunology. They are important because uh, they help uh, deal with illnesses and injury. So they are very important. Okay, so they also uh, help regulate the, the amount of salts in the, in the body as well as uh, help balance water. So they balance the water, con the salt content, uh, as well as the water. So we also have uh, waxes. So waxes are waxes are mostly unsaturated. Waxes are actually unsaturated. So what that entails is that these waxes are usually solid at room temperature. I'm sure in human beings, if, if you've tried to clean your ears, the ears are actually able to produce some, some, waxy, uh, some waxes so that it actually helps protect the ear from other... So these waxes are usually non-polar, right? Meaning they are, they are water hating. You can also find these waxes on leaves of, of, of most plants. Remember, this course, Cells and Biomolecules, is just basically about... Uh, uh, knowing your definition, knowing the function, the application of all these biomolecules in, uh, in, in real life situation and how they actually, uh, in their applications in humans and their applications in the world. So now when you look at these waxes, you find that most leaves have got, uh, they've got wax. You look at these, they're able to actually produce these. So these are, these are solid, meaning they protect, they protect because they are non-polar. They are able to protect the ears from other chemicals that may try to enter the ear because they are non-polar. So it can actually protect you from some polar, polar chemicals that may be harmful. So under waxes, we also have oils. Uh, oils. Then uh, for, for triglycerides, these are perfectly insoluble. And they are also important. These are high energy for the triglycerides, these are high energy molecules. All right, so they are needed uh, as energy in the cells. In the case where uh, your glucose has been depleted, 
as well as other energy molecules are depleted, your body can actually break down these glycerides and use them for energy. All right. So apart from uh, steroids, we also have sphingolipids. Now, sphingolipids are a class of compounds which are fatty acid derivatives of sphingosine. All right. I'm sure you remember your sphingosine. We covered this. So we covered uh, we covered sphingosine. So most of these sphingol lipids are very important in protecting uh, surfaces against harmful environments. So you talk about uh, protection of some cells from certain harmful agents. So these are actually very, very important. There are more, um, there are different other types of lipids. We've got, uh, we've got LLPs, VLDLs. We, we also have HDLs. We also have EPAs. Uh, we've got PUFAs and all those other. But these are the major types of phospholipids that are of importance at this, at this stage. Okay, so now we go to the next question. Question number eight. Okay, question number eight. With examples, discuss the function of oils and waxes in living organisms. I think I've talked about this one already. Uh, nevertheless, we'll, we'll still uh, talk about it. So oils, oils, when we look at oils, and waxes, these are very important in cell division, cell division, they are important in cell division, also insulation, right, for some of you that are, that, that know, uh, that are electricians. <laughs> you know that when we talk about insulation, we're just talking about protecting the wires with some insulatory material, right? So in the same manner, we've got some, most, some oils and waxes. Some oils and waxes are able to insulate certain, uh, certain cells in the body, so they, pro they do a protective covering. All right, and I talked about the, the, the ears, how your ears are able to produce some wax and provide some uh, protection. They also function in, uh, they also, they are also important as energy reserves or for energy storage, right? Meaning when these are broken down, when, they, they, when these oils and waxes are broken down, they can actually liberate energy that is used uh, by the cells. So they also, they are also important in other biological roles, which we'll discuss hopefully in the other course. All right. Okay. So the last question, and we'll be done with this uh, short tutorial shit. The last, the last question says: Describe the common chemical tests used for the identification of fats and oils. So. When you, I'm sure you've already covered uh, this question with, in the labs with uh, Mr. Mnalola, where you did uh, the test for, for, for lipids. So there are, there are many methods that can be used, but I, I'm just going to talk about the, 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 the emulsion test, the ethanol emulsion test. So under the ethanol emulsion test, 
uh, here we simply uh, here we simply introduce uh, we introduce we introduce your lipids to ethanol. So what actually happens if you have, let's say this is your test tube. This is your test tube. What happens is you can put one meal of one meal of your, your lipid or your fat, one meal of your lipid. Then you introduce either an equal amount of ethanol, all right, depending on which SOP you are using. So you can introduce some ethanol then you shake the mixture. You say you shake the mixture for a specified period of time. You shake the mixture for about five minutes and you let it settle for a while. After that, after about maybe 30 minutes or so, you can add some water to this test. And what is gonna happen is that upon addition of water, you actually observe a cloudy, a white cloudy, emulsion, right? You observe the cloudy emulsion within this. That signifies that your lipids are present in a particular sample. It actually tells you that the sample you are actually testing is definitely a lipid. So there are other tests. You can also use the grease, um, the grease spot test. You can also use the grease spot test. All right. So the grease uh, spot test is uh, very easy. You just get your, your filter paper. You put a drop of your, your lipid here. Then alongside it, you can put some water. So you let it settle for a few minutes. After a while, you observe that the water usually actually dries out. But you still see uh, some, some lipid absorbed. So you can actually see that it's actually negative when if, if your sample just dries out. But if it's actually a lipid, remember these are insoluble, right? So the filter paper tends to actually absorb it. Then you can add a reagent, possibly most likely an ether. You actually add an ether, then you see it actually spread out. And that's, you can actually confirm to say this is actually uh, a lipid. So one other important uh, uh, thing that you need to know about uh, fatty acids is there are what we call essential fatty acids and non-essential fatty acids. Uh, essential fatty acids are fatty acids that your body cannot generate. You actually need to uh, get these from a diet. Most of these are, are found in some, some fishes and, and other sources, usually of uh, plant origin. Okay, so these essential fatty acids, your body cannot generate them, so you need to get them from your diet. Whereas non-essential fatty acids are fatty acids that your body can generate on its own. Okay, that being said, that is the end of our uh, tutorial sheet number four. So see you on Friday when we'll be tackling another tutorial sheet. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. If you have any concerns, any, any, anything that you did not understand, leave a comment on the comment section and we'll get back to you. Thank you.